Hey everybody, and welcome to tutorial two, part two. And the reason why there's a part two is because you're getting introduced to these objects in a very concrete situation. I need some sort of example to show you what the objects do. But the much more important part of learning the objects is learning how transferable they are, learning how flexible they are, learning that each object actually does very little on its own, and it's only in combination with other objects that some end or some goal or some uncertainty is achieved. So it's a little bit incomplete to only see these objects in the context of the tutorial in which they're shown in, in one, one combination or one configuration of objects. It tends to give the impression that this is how they should be used or this is what they're best at. When in fact, it's quite arbitrary. I'm picking simple examples to show the concepts. But it's understandable that you would attach the object to the example that you learned it with. So I just want to do this secondary tutorial to show the objects in other contexts. And specifically to show the objects in different combinations than you saw them in the tutorial. So here I've created our, by this time, familiar structure of playlist tilde objects mixing their sound to a sound output. And I want to revisit the route object, which we've used so far to look for when a sound is done. And the right outlet of a message box will display that. So we play a sound, and when it's done, we get the number of the sound that's finished and the file name. We can also put a second argument into route, start, so we can find when a sound is done and find when a sound has started. And when I click away from this, note that a new outlet will appear. So now I have three outlets, one for done, one for start, and a third outlet that we didn't talk about before. The third outlet is a reject outlet. It's anything that the route doesn't understand. So just to test that out over here. If I say done one xxx dot wave, that's going to come out my first outlet. If I say start two I dot wave, that's going to come out my second outlet. And my third outlet is going to be anything it doesn't understand. Cats, three, dogs. It's not searching for any list that starts with the word cats, so it's just going to dump it, dump the whole list out the right outlet. So let's see this in practice. There's the start, there's the end. And what you may want to do it works better for my brain, is just to put start on the left and done on the right. And we get our start here and our done there. But before, what we did is we just took this whole message and turned it into a button press and used the button press to create our feedback loop. But what we can do here instead is we can actually recruit our select object to look for the start of a specific sound, the start of sound three. And select will send a button press when it receives a three. And the context in which we used the select before, recall, was with images. Where a number came in to the select, and send a button press to the corresponding outlet. Send a one, it bangs the first image. Send a two, it bangs the second image. And the select has a reject outlet where it will pass any message that it doesn't recognize. If I send it a four, it doesn't bang any of the buttons and send a four out its right outlet. 
But this is different in one respect from the reject output of the route, in that select doesn't process lists. So that if I send the list three cats to the select, it will bang the third outlet. But if I send it a message that it will reject, like seven cats, it will not send the whole message out. Because when it receives a list, it actually only considers the first element in the list and strips off the rest of the information. So applying that here, it's receiving a list that begins with a number followed by a file name. It ignores the file name completely and just looks at the first element in that list. And of course, we can put multiple arguments in our select, one, two, three. And now we have the ability to trigger other events in sync with events here. So for instance, we could have any time we start sound one here, it's also going to start sound one in the playlist to the right. And we can also say any time sound one finishes, it will do something else, like for instance, play sound two from the right playlist. And these don't need to be short sounds like this. These could be quite long sounds, or these could be video files, uh, or any process or event that you want to trigger when things are starting and ending. So what's gonna happen is I play sound file one. When sound file one begins, it will play this sound, uh, the sound number one, and when it ends, it will play sound number two. Shorten that up a little. So what we've done here is we've combined the concepts of route and select. And we've also taken our select out of the context in which we learned it and used the same object in a different context. So let's do that a couple more times. So another object that we looked at is less than which we looked at in the context of probabilities of something happening. So if our value is less than 50, then we're going to get a response of 1, true. 12 is less than 50, so we get 1, true. If our response is greater than 50, we're going to get false. And of course, this pairs well with select. Where we can have events that happen when the condition is true, and events that happen when the condition is false. This also pairs very well with toggle. Something can be turned on when the condition is met and turned off when the condition is not met. But another thing that can be done here is we can take the toggle, which is generating ones and zeros, and do something along the lines of less than one. What's going to happen there? The toggle puts out a 1 or a 0. So if the toggle sends out a 1, that is false that a 1 is less than 1. So this toggle will be 0. And if a toggle puts out a 0, a 0 is less than 1, so this toggle is true. So this is a simple way to invert a toggle. So we're taking the same object that we saw in a totally different context and just using what we know that it does to do something else that's, that's quite useful to us in the sense that perhaps we have two G gates and we just want them to be opposite each other. We want them to be 
out of phase. So these two G gates will always oppose each other. Let's take a look at another transferable concept related to this example of being able to invert a number box. I'm going to encapsulate all of this just to get it out of the way and bring in some video files. And one of the nice things about video is that video is a message. Sound is not. So you can't take an object like G gate and send sound through it. You need an object like gate tilde. And that is going to allow you to have a gate that works on sound. But video passes as a message. So I can take video and put it right into a G gate. And I can take this video file and put it into this G gate. And as the gate switch, the video will pass out one outlet or the other. So, so I'll make a couple of layers. And I'll pass both left outlets to one layer and both right outlets to another layer. Because of this structure we've set up where these gates are always opposite one another, there's never going to be two videos flowing to the same inlet of a layer. Let's see what this looks like. Jitta world. Floating one. Toggle to turn it on. And I'll position these layers. And I've got both of my videos playing. And if I want to swap which layer they're going to, I can lock my patch and click the toggle. So now I've got the video flip-flopping back and forth between the two layers. And there certainly are other ways to do this, um, but this is a simple way based on the objects that you have right now. Another combination of concepts that we can look at is delay and the message box because delay only delays button presses this button press be delayed by one second I click it a second later it comes out there and if I want to delay a number there's actually a different object for that called pipe and pipe will delay this number by one second. One second later, a one comes out. And it will delay a stream of numbers as well. So if I make some series of numbers here, we'll see a second later that series of numbers echoed below. This is a useful object. But what about delaying a message? Well, there isn't actually an object that delays a message. So we have to build a structure that delays a message. But it's actually quite easy to do based on the objects that we already know. So for instance, if I wanted to disable one of these layers, I could maybe send the enable zero message to that, and it just turns off that video layer. And if I send it the enable one message, it turns on the video layer. And how do we know that jit.gl.layer responds to this message? Well, because we know that the layer has the enable attribute. 
So if it has the attribute, it's almost certain it also has the message. There's only very, very few examples in Max where this is not the case, that, that an attribute has an accompanying message that you can send. So if I want to say, turn off this layer for one second, I want it to be turned off for a second, and then I want it to come back on. How can I use my delay, which doesn't delay messages, in order to do that? One thing I can do is just insert the delay between the messages. So this enable zero is going to do two things. It's going to turn off the layer. It's also going to trigger this button. The button press is delayed by one second, which enables, re-enables the layer one second later. So it's going to be a blink. It's going to go off and then turn itself back on. Off, turn itself back on. Okay, but what if we wanted to be able to delay any message by a second? Slightly different structure would be required. And again, one that we actually already know how to build. So whatever I do to the left layer, I want to happen one second later to the right layer. So I have enable zero and one buttons. I can turn this layer off and on, and I want this layer to follow suit one second later. I can use the right inlet of the message box to store my message, and then I can use a delayed bang to send the message to the right-hand layer. So let's just take a clear look at this. When I click Enable Zero, it disables the left layer because there's a direct connection. This message flows to the left layer. And the message also gets stored in this message box because we're using the right inlet. And then if something bangs this delay, it will send that message one second later. And what would bang it? Well, the same button that's setting it. So either button will actually cause the delay to begin. So again, I say enable one, it will immediately enable the left layer, and then one second later, enable the right layer. And then enable zero, will disable left, and then one second later, right. Are there other ways to do this? Certainly, but this is a way that emerges from the relatively small number of objects that you already know. Uh, let's take another example. Encapsulate this, and I'm gonna go and de-encapsulate my one from before, de-encapsulate, get that stuff back. I'm going to combine a couple of concepts here. I'm going to combine random, our math object, and delay. So I'm going to take a random four and add one to it. So I get values one, two, three, and four. And then I'm going to multiply that by 250 so that I get 250, 500, 750, and 1,000. And I'm going to use those as delay times in milliseconds, setting my delay time with the right inlet of my delay object. And I'm going to use the button press to generate the random value. And the same button press will be the one that is delayed. And this is where max right to leftness comes into play. This button press is going to go here first. It's going to generate the random number, add one, multiply it by 250, set the delay. Then it's going to delay the button press, which can go up here in our feedback loop and change its own delay time and then delay itself. And again, if we don't want this to be an infinite, infinite loop, it's useful to put a G gate in there. I'm going to re-encapsulate this stuff just to make some space here. Move this structure over. 
and insert my loop breaking G gate. And if you want to see this value changing, you can certainly insert a number box there. If you want to hear what this sounds like, we'll also have this send a message of one over to one of our sounds. Similarly, random two is going to give us randomly either the values zero or one. It's a coin toss, a binary coin toss. This can feed directly into a G gate. It can feed directly into a toggle, and in fact the toggle isn't even necessary. One could hook this directly up to anything that takes uh, binary information, like and enable adder UI, randomly turning the layer on and off. So this is what I want you to work on, and this is what's going to be in the assignment, is this notion of taking the objects and using them, trying them in a different context from how you learn them, to build your ability to generalize your understanding of them, to see that these objects on their own do very little, but are applicable in a large variety of situations. And this goes back to this notion of language. These objects are like words, and words can function in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different contexts, as can all of the objects in Max, as can all of the instructions in any programming language. These are versatile little modules that we can leverage to do a whole bunch of different stuff. And a lot of that stuff is going to be practical and useful, but a lot of it also is going to be surprising and interesting. And those are both territories we're going to explore, obviously, with the emphasis on the surprising and interesting, but there does need to be a certain uh, amount of logic and predictability also in the things that we build.